know, but perhaps the way it is progressing, it might just be very soon. So if you try to understand what general and narrow intelligence means, narrow intelligence means using the AI for a specific task. So it's not a jack of all trades, but it becomes a master of none because it has been fine-tuned and tailored on that particular task. And general AI will be smart and intelligent, but it will be very flexible and intelligent and capable of learning various tasks, complex tasks, and multitasking at the same time. Let's try to understand the whole spectrum of artificial intelligence. So I spoke about understanding artificial intelligence. There are two more terms we need to understand. One is machine learning and one is deep learning. Let me simplify this for you guys. So the whole subset of artificial intelligence, there is another set called machine learning. The machine learns from a pattern, from a set of data, and it gives you a prediction. A subset of machine learning is deep learning where it involves neural networks. And a subset of deep learning is generative AI. That is where your chat GPT comes. How many of us in this room have used chat GPT? Can I have a raise of hands? So we have a chat GPT literate audience. So that's where the subset of AI is you're using, where it is being used to generate a content. Let's get a little bit more familiar with these terms. We are all aware of um, the Google Photos. And it, you understand that in what happens in Google Photos is that it takes the pattern of your face it takes the pattern of your face, it picks it up, and um, it maps it and it clubs your photos into the category of your mom, of your dad, of your brother, of your sister, of your wife, of your child. And this uses the technology of computer vision and the whole concept of artificial intelligence based on this. Machine learning, as I al already defined this term to you in the earlier slide, it basically means recognizing this pattern and then making certain predictions from this pattern. And when this pattern is in the form of a neural network, we call it deep learning. These neural networks mimics the neural networks in our brain. If I try to give you an understanding of the different types of machine learning, these are the three most important types of machine learning. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. Supervised learning is where the machine is being supervised to give a prediction or a pattern recognition outcome. It's task driven. Most common models are classification and regression. And the other one is unsupervised learning, which is more data driven. It more does the work in form of clustering. Reinforcement learning is most commonly used in games, gaming, but it's going to be very much used in healthcare because it is going to be learning, learning with, with a positive and a negative reward mechanism, mechanism feedback. So you can see this example here. You see machine learning, unsupervised learning will be used in clustering, in big data visualization, in structured discovery. Allow me to take all this laser pointer in structured discovery, etc., in targeted marketing. Supervised learning is used in regression models like market forecasting, weather forecasting, where reinforcement learning is used in learning tasks, robot navigation, skill acquisition, and this is where it's going to be very useful in the domain of healthcare. So this is a very brief understanding of machine learning. What about neural networks? It's basically the neural networks, like the neural networks in our brain. And it has got multiple layers. It starts with an input layer, where the instruction is going in from the user side. There is a multiple hidden layer, where a lot of layers of iterations are done. And then there is a final output layer. So what happens exactly in deep learning? You give the image of a dog, and it predicts that it's a dog. You give the image of a cat, and it undergoes multiple layers of iteration and each layer there is a lot of fine tuning happening, a lot of understanding happening and it predicts that it's a cat. Let's put this example in the context of medicine. We will understand this better. So what happens here? You have an x-ray of an individual and you can see there is a step called feature extraction and classification which is a typical part of machine learning and look based on this particular algorithm it is predicting whether this has TB or not. So you give the image based on the learning and the data set on which it has learned. It is predicting whether the image is positive for TV or negative for tuberculosis. Similarly, if you can put the same image through a, let net, uh, through a layer of neural networks, now at this point, this is the same mimicking of a neural network as you can see, where the feature extraction and classification is in the same place. And through multiple layers of iteration, it is giving a prediction whether this image of an X ray is positive for TV or not. If you try to Give an analogy to this, our human brain does the same exact thing. We are used to seeing an image and we used to create a pattern of it, map it in our brain, and that's why we say, okay, this is possibly a Cox node or a Cox point, and this is possibly likelihood of a TB. So this is the same kind of a learning that you're allowing machine to do. So then what is generative AI? The term itself means generative, means it's generating content. So it is capable of generating text, image, 
or other media in response to the instruction that you give and this instruction is called prompting and this is the most important part of artificial intelligence skill because the better you prompt the better the response of the better outcome your artificial intelligence is going to give you and this is exactly what we are doing in our chat gpt but how does this happen exactly the data that we are giving to chat gpt could be in the form of a text we are giving an instruction it could be an image you could just upload an image you could give a speech instruction so this undergoes through a model which is called the foundation model or a transformer model and this model has been built on brilliance and trillions of data the larger the model size the more sensitive is the output of the uh, of the particular model that's how good chat gpt is because it has been trained on billions and trillions of data at every level there is levels of deep learning iterations and adaptations happening and then you get Re the results in the form of question answering, sentiment analysis, image captioning, object recognition, instruction following, and all this in uses something called natural language processing, which it means the computer picks up the instruction in your language, codes it into its binary coding, but gives you back the response in your language. So it's called natural language processing, and this is what makes artificial intelligence so user-friendly, especially for us doctors and clinicians. But the instruction that you give to this computer is very, very important, and that is called prompting. The act or the art is of prompting. The science is called prompt engineering. Trust me, this is a big science subject. It's prompt engineering. And if you don't give the right prompt, then you will end up putting the whole system into a wrong space where it might end up hallucinating and give you a wrong response. And especially in healthcare, we do not want to get there. So how to give a good prompt? This is very, very important. The first step of giving a good, good prompt is to understand the purpose of the prompt. So you have to define very clearly what you want to achieve from the interaction with the AI. This is something which I just told to the medical students in the medical college that the AI that you use will be as intelligent as you are. So the more intelligent way you are giving the prompt, the better intelligent way the AI is going to get back to it. It's a fantastic mirror image of yourself. Most importantly, keep it very clear, make your prompts very clear, concise and specific. Avoid any kind of ambiguity. Use a priming prompt. So for example, if you wanted to think like an expert diabetologist with an experience as, uh, as great as Dr. Bansi Sabu sir, then you must tell that you are an experienced diabetologist with more than 30 years of experience and you, you are looking for a research article on this topic. So that is a priming prompt. Keep experiment with the prompt, ask multiple formats of questions, use different, lang different ways of asking so that you get the best responses out of it. So that covers the basics, a very brief basics of AI where we can start with. Now the question is, why do we need to start with artificial intelligence and where do we need to start from? So the first question that we need to understand and we need to answer to ourselves is that why would Dr. Bansi Sabu have a pre-conference workshop on artificial intelligence? Why is this so really, really very important? The next slide will give you the answer. So this, this whole iceberg that you see here is, is the problem. Now, the, what we are used to seeing and what we are used to learning and what we are used to uh, working on is just the tip of the iceberg. And that is the evidence-based medicine. Once you add artificial intelligence to this, you get exposure to the whole of the iceberg, and that is data-driven, intelligence-based precision medicine. And this is important in healthcare. This is where we are heading, because we want to be patient-centric, we want to be individualized, every individual is different, and we want to have a data-driven, intelligence-based precision medicine over and above the layer of evidence-based medicine, which has been practiced over the last three or four decades. But where will this data be coming from? The sources of the data will be, of course, from your labs, from your imagings, from your medical records, from the medical devices, from all your wearables, your mobile apps. Yes, that can also transmit the data, the sensors, the geospatial data is important. The geospatial data, your location, your behavioral pattern, your internet usage pattern, all this can give you a lot of data and also your dietary intake if you're logging them in most of the apps which they do your physical activity, etc. All that can be used in screening and prevention, diagnosis and prognosis and treatment and management AI algorithms. And this is going to be a continuous process where all the data will go into the cloud through a set of big data and it is going to be a continuous process of data analytics and visualization and predictive analytics coming out of it. 
So let's try to simplify and understand this. So what happens? All this data is your input. That could be text, that could be CT, MRI, USG, histopathological images. It could be your biometric data from the variables. That goes into an analysis. It could be machine learning, deep learning. It could have a layer of generative artificial intelligence to it. It will end up giving you a classification, some kind of a prediction in the term of epidemic during COVID, we had that. It could give you an image generation, which could be used as for you to, uh, for example, explain a disease to the, to the patient. It will always have a control and a feedback mechanism, which will use reinforcement learning, because at every level, the AI will learn from what you're teaching, and it will keep on trying to get itself better in a more nuanced and a more personalized response. But then what's in it for us? Where do we start from? So the first thing that we need to do is have a foundation knowledge of AI, because if we don't know the basics, we would probably not be apt enough to use it or rather identify where to use it. So it's where we start with, with workshops like this, where we have a basic understanding of AI and machine learning. We have a look at some kind of data science principles. Understanding data science is boring, but sometimes knowing the basics of data science will help us. Get ourselves familiar with these relevant algorithms, which can help us probably decide that which algorithm will work for which subset of data or which particular purpose we want to use in healthcare. And then you start collaborating and you start uh, finding those applications in the healthcare fraternity, because you are the person who is in the ground zero and you understand what's the need gap and what AI can solve. So the most important practical step in this, out of this is identify the clinical needs, collaborate with the AI expert, and always and always be, uh, be ready to adopt, be ready to adapt, and have that, that hunger of continuous learning because this is a continuously evolving space and we need to be very, very curious about this. The four very important steps of the foundation knowledge is learn the basics of AI, learn the basics of data science principle, be familiar with the relevant AI algorithms, and try to use generative AI because it's a fantastic, powerful tool in your clinical practice. Summarizing about the whole concept of AI is this slide. AI is going to help us see what we have been missing. Probably it will help us do more good to our patients than do harm. Uh, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. That's what we have been taught. That's what we have learned. But probably unintentionally we've been doing harm because we were trying to do more good. So we need to do precisely the good thing for the patient. We need to be very point, point blank specific. There is no margin for error. That's what AI is going to help us get there. So now we know why. We have the answer to why. We have the answer to where. Now let's start using artificial intelligence. Right? We are ready for that? All right. Let's look some example of diabetes care. Now, do we all agree here in this room? This is Diacare Con, so I thought I'll give you some examples of diabetes. Do you all agree these are the problem statements in diabetes? All of them, most of them, right? How many of us feel AI can solve all these problems? Not all the problems, some of the problems. Some of the problems. Which is the problem that you feel will get solved most with artificial intelligence? Right. I'm very optimistic. I feel all of the problems will get solved. <laughs> but we'll have to use it. We have to use it in the right way and we will be able to know. So the question is here that can artificial intelligence solve all of these challenges? Let's see where artificial intelligence is now being used. So there are a lot of studies which has shown that you can have a good disease prediction and risk stratification using artificial intelligence in diabetes care. You have a good amount of Gen AI chatbots. Madhuya is one such example that we have built. I'll show you in a while which is fantastic in diabetes self-management education. We understand that DSM is so, so very important. We've been advocating about it, but we've not been able to, there's always been a gap between the practice and the preach. So AI is gonna solve, the Gen AI chatbots, the virtual chatbots are gonna solve this problem. So spoke about the use of AI in insulin pump and continuous glucose monitoring system. That's a fantastic space that is evolving. We have seen the use of AI in retinopathic screening, in diabetic foot screening and monitoring, screening of the diabetic foot ulcers, remote monitoring of patients who are in the, uh, you know, um, in rural areas who cannot visit the podiatrist or the doctor on a regular basis. And the icing on the cake is going to be having a virtual endocrinologist or a diabetologist uh, in a complete system, ecosystem of clinical decision support system, which will enable the, the real do doctor, the real endocrinologist or diabetologist towards more precision diabetes care. So all these six blocks, I personally believe, and there's a lot of evidence, I'm going to show you some of them, that will be used in diabetes care. 
So a lot of studies are there that machine learning tools like su support vector mechanisms and logistic regressions are used in diabetes predictions. It uses data mining, uses a lot of NLP from the electronic health record data, and you can have geospatial and geo geographical uh, predictive models being created and risk stratifications of diabetes, diabetes can be done. This is some of the paper. You can see approach of an early disease detection of logistic regression risk prediction. So these some kind of papers do exist. You can see cardiovascular and stroke risk stratification in diabetic foot infectious patients. There's publications on all of this. Another space that you need to watch out is, is the digital twin. And this is a space where Sir himself has worked on. I'm going to show you his paper right after this. And it's like creating a digital twin of an individual and then mimicking the responses and understanding the responses of that individual in a digital twin environment. This is one some of the studies. And you can see here Dr. Sabu and Dr. Jyoti Dev has participated in some of the studies of the, of the twin health technology. And, and they have been doing fantastic work on this. And this is a space we need to watch out for. You have seen the use of diabetic retinopathy, and we have seen the use in the neural networks, the deep learning models in diabetic retinopathy screening. I think many of us have used this in our clinics as well, and they do fantastic screening. What it does, it increases the sensitivity of early, mild, moderate NPDR detection. It 100% screens out the site threatening retinopathy, so nobody will go blind if the person has retinopathy because they can be picked up and referred to the clinician. This is, this is the most, uh, I mean, uh, uh, happiest part is what, what Sir was talking about, the AI-driven adjustments in 780G, because it adjusts the basal insulin every five minutes, which is dri driven by the pattern uh, of the control theory that the PID algorithm that it does, but it also has an AI meal detection, so it kind of gives a guidance to the doses. And of course, it has a smart Bluetooth connectivity enabling much more user-friendly manner, and then you get results like this, 100% time in range in, in patients on 780G. Now let's look at some of the other aspect of using uh, AI in our day-to-day -day practice. We all recognize that this is a continuous glucose monitoring graph. Earlier days, when ChatGPT 3.5 had uh, 4 had not yet evolved, we had used advanced data analytics part of ChatGPT to give you a summarization of this complex graph. So for a patient, it might be a little difficult to understand these graphs or even for a allied healthcare provider. So you could use a generative AI tool to simplify this and give a summary of this chart. Take a look at this chart. This is a chart of one of our patient having readings all over the place. This is a Libre Pro reading, of course. And uh, this, is, this is his total profile. As you can see, he's like, he's hyperglycemic in most of these uh, 14 days graph. And now when you feed this into Something that we have built is a custom GPT, which is a uh, CGM analyzer. You will get summaries like this. So it gives you key observations. It takes the whole graph. You don't need to do anything. You just need to upload the PDF. It has been trained on it. Um, so it gives you the key observations in terms of uh, the daily average glucose trends, the hypoglycemic episodes, the hyperglycemic spells. Also speaks about something on the glycemic variability in its way, own way of unsupervised learning understanding. Summary summarizes the daily reading and makes some recommendation. So imagine this is powerful because it gives you a uh, generative AI, natural language process based inference to the patient, somebody who doesn't understand anything about continuous glucose monitoring when they are using. Perhaps a better understanding using generative AI might make the patient more compliant in using this more frequent leading to more uh, better glycemic control. So this is the CGMS guide. You can take a screenshot of this and use this, but this is only available to ChatGPT plus users. So if you're a paid user, you will have access to this. What I have done is we have trained this on over 200 uh, CGM data, both the Libre and the Libre Pro data. So it has been custom tuned on, on the responses that it is going to give. And you can start exploring this in your clinic. Maybe just keep it bedside, have a ChatGPT on and have a CGM uh, analyzer, scan it, and just show it to the patient, look, this is a report, or take a printout of this and just give it to the patient for better understanding. So if it interests you to understand more about how we can use generative AI, this was one of our publication last year in Dr. Jyoti Dev's journal, where we looked at all the potential possibilities of using chat GPT and generative AI uh, in, in, in diabetes care. And hopefully, we will be able to have another publication tomorrow or day after, where we have actually used AI in data analytics in the same journal. So, uh, uh, so this is a paper. This is a free-to-read journal. You can scan the QR and take a look how generative AI can potentially improve and I, I personally feel the improvement is going to be more in diabetes self-management education because that is where the role of the virtual chatbots are going to be. So 
if you want to explore that way we have uh, uh, we had developed a tool called Madhu AI and uh, allow me to introduce to you this is a chatbot which is kind of based on WhatsApp user interface so it is integration of a large language model a generative AI platform now it's a cocktail of three to four models it's using GPT it's using uh, Lama it's also using Mistral sometimes based on the complexity of the questions asked and it puts the user on the chat gives the the power of using uh, AI on on chat on on WhatsApp and and the good part about this was that we had the opportunity to validate the response of it this is where the AI literacy has taken us we had a fantastic team and Dr. Rutul, Hitesh, they were they all a part of this study we conducted this uh, more than 100 doctors were sent this to evaluate and validate Sir himself is a, was a part of this uh, of this research and we'll be publishing this data very soon where we for the first time we figured out a way of validating an AI response so we were looking at human validation of AI response uh, and this was a slide that Dr. Peter had presented in ESD. I remember he had sent me a snapshot of this, that uh, we, 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 talk, we call it like it Madhu is made in India for the world, the first WhatsApp user interface AI chatbot. So the idea here is that we have the power of AI, but we need to tame it and use it in the right way. What we did in the, the validation of Madhu was we did a random validation with about 110 doctors and then we had standardized validation, one-to-one uh, -one validation with human experts, about 10 to 11 doctors have done that, and we are trying to do a patient use validation uh, at the moment uh, with ethical clearance. With Madhu, we try to do human validation of AI response, and we are hoping that we will get a uh, good response coming out and more fine-tuned response and more and more tools like this. Madhu is just an example, kind of setting the benchmark. There should be more and more tools coming out like this that will be safer to use and doctors would be confident to allow their patients to use on. So let's look at how, how Madhu works. So I, all you need to do is tap on this button of Madhu and it takes you uh, to your WhatsApp and then you, you type in this message called uh, Hi Madhu. Allow me to just go out of uh, present view. Yeah. So it takes you to so once then you give a prompt like I'm a type 1 diabetic and uh, uh, tell me what I should do for 10 years. Uh, do I have a risk of developing complications associated with diabetes? So this is a question you're asking Madhu and then you start looking at the response that it gives. So then it does give you the response based on how much you want to know. So sometimes you might want to know less. So it will give you a smaller response if you want. Uh, then uh, elaboration of that is going to give you a longer elaborative details of the responses. Right, so let's see what it gives. What prompt you give, but in this case, Madhu is like you're just chatting, it's a chatbot, so you don't need to really be careful about the prompt, you just chat chat with it. Because we had, so as a patient, you're asking the question, so you can just uh, ask it in, in any way. The so that is that, so we have already trained Madhu for that. So this is where Madhu has been trained. Now, for example, this is being trained as a patient education bot. So now, Madhu will only give the patient-related information. Voice yes, it does take in voice as well. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it, it and the, the, the other part is, of course, it works in all the languages. Every, some, uh, people have tried in Korean, people have tried in Chinese. Peter had, Dr. Peter Swaza tried in German. I think they have all tried in their own regional languages. So it works in, in, in all the languages. And now for the doctors, we have picked up something which is, which is very useful and I'm going to show you that in the next slide. So the point I'm trying to show here is when you're using Madhu, it's going to give you the response that only the patient needs to hear. If you ask too complex a question, it will straight away say that this is a domain where you need to visit your healthcare provider. So at any point, it will not try to replace the doctor, but rather re-emphasize and push the patient to see the doctor and fetch healthcare uh, service from the doctor at the right point of time. This is based on the science of just-in-time timely intervention. It means when you hit the patient with the right information at the right point of time, there is likelihood of more compliance coming to the treatment which is being offered. So the DSME apps using chatbots are going to work here. Now, can we use Madhu to summarize our document? Now look, look at this. This is very, very interesting. Now what I've done here is I have uploaded a prescription of mine and I'm saying I'm a 60 year old diabetic patient. Can you help me understand my prescription? Okay, so let's see what response Madhu is giving us. Allow it some time, it takes a little time to process because it goes through the server, 
then it goes through the GPU, takes the feedback from the language model and gives it back to us. Now see what it has done. It has taken the whole prescription and it has broken the whole prescription down into the different medications. Along with the different medication, it specifies the dose of the medications and it also tells what purpose the medication is for. So there goes your all the problems of pill mixing in a 61 year old or a 70 year old patient. Right? Now the problem is I do not understand English. So I need this in my regional language. So I have asked that can you please explain this to me in my language which is Bengali. So let's see what, what it gives us. So you can see each of the drugs have been also classified into its generic groups, which is which is fantastic, because sometimes patients want to know what is the generic group which is uh, present, what is the composition of the drug, what is the dose of the drug, what is the purpose of this drug has been given. Sometimes, you know, when you put the statin as the number 10 drug, patient feels that's the least important drug, and the aspirin and the statin, they often stop on their on their own. But when this happens, then they will not do that. So this is the response that they're getting in Bengali. So the whole the whole prescription has been taken by the language model. The PDF has been converted into text format and in a uh, easy format of in which the patient can assimilate has been, uh, has been explained. And again, if I can ask, give me the brief uh, purpose of each of the medication, it's going to go on and give me various responses. So like see, it can tell you now it's giving the individual medicine in English and below it's writing in Bengali the, ex the only the purpose of the medicine what each of these medicines are for which one is my blood pressure medication which one is my diabetes medication which one is my thyroid medication which one is for my diabetic neuropathy which is my statin so this will be a very useful tool uh, not just Madhu but this whole concept that if you can have a prescription analyzing similar for a doctor now you have a bunch of a report to look at you just feed it to the system and you just ask it to understand it and then you ask that give me the interpretation of the lipid profile, give me the interpretation of the liver function test. So you really don't need to have the whole thing, uh, read the whole thing, rather that is the time where you need to connect with the patient in empathizing with the patient and spend more time in understanding the patient. Because what happens now is if you're using electronic medical record, you're not treating the patient, you're treating the computer because your eyes are fixed on the computer and you're talking to the patient because you have to finish that patient in 10 minutes. So I'm going to give you a solution to that as well in the upcoming slides. So this is what Madhu can do. It can summarize your prescriptions, your PDFs, your reports. Now, so problem with us is clinical documentation. So what happens is when the patient gives you a medical history, we need to, uh, okay, let me start playing this. We need to write down their medical, medical history and for that, we just keep typing, looking at the computer, talk, talking to the patient, sometimes missing on the point. So what if we could have a speech to text conversion tool that can just completely take the whole conversation. Wait, let me pause and explain to you what happens here. What if we can have something that will completely take in the speech and convert it into text and after converting into text, it is also going to summarize the whole conversation and it is going to auto-populate it electronic medical records. That is going to be fantastic to the use case of a doctor and possibly that will improve the adoption of electronic health record. So what we have done here is we have uploaded a video file, of an audio file of a conversation which is about an 18 to 19 minutes conversation between me and my patient. Patient had been giving me this concern. This is a sample audio conversation and now I've fed this into another custom GPT which we had initially built called OpenAI MediNote Assistant. Right now this is not in the public domain but uh, I'll show you what you can use. Uh, after that what it does is that it takes the whole conversation and it breaks it up. It breaks it up into the conversation. Now what we have trained this language model to do is it will classify the whole conversation into the patient profile, into the clinical history. So it will talk about whether we have discussed about hyperglycemia, about the hypoglycemic episodes, about the exercise, about the diet. These are exact what you want to write it down in your medical records. It will classify the symptoms which the patient has discussed with you throughout the, throughout the 20 minutes of conversation. It will classify the medication separately that has been discussed. All the medication change gets classified. The investigation reports which we had discussed in that conversation, you can see here, all the previously it was 7.1 HP1C, currently it's 7.2, so the target below is 7 in the next quarter. These are the conversations I was having with the patient and that has been classified. 
Beyond that, the biggest advantage of using these kind of tools will be if you have a consent taken, we often don't document it, but when you ha use this kind of a tool, your verbal discussion becomes a, actually an informed consent that gets documented. So imagine the medical legal advantage that you will have using a tool like this. So what we can start using is, again, I'm not endorsing anything, but these are available on the uh, internet. This is called Freed AI. It's available over subscription. And you can start using this as your ready reckoner for uh, AI assistant to convert the conversation between your patient and uh, get a text conversation and a summary. At the moment, if it's not integrated with your electronic health record, so auto-population will not be done. So you have to copy it and paste it into electronic health record, which is still a doable thing. But I'm sure EMR companies will be coming up with these integrations very soon. Let's see how we are doing this on Freed. So now I'm going to show you the same example of that same conversation that we showed you in ChatGPT. It, it, this does better, be better than ChatGPT because this is again a used language model and it has been trained specific, it's a narrow AI. So you can see here, once I've uploaded the audio, it has given me uh, a complete summary of the whole conversation. This is the same conversation which I had which I had shown you earlier. Then it classifies the objectives of the of the whole conversation. It classifies it into physical examination, diagnostic test results. It classifies the assessments and the plan. Same thing which which our GPT model was also doing. That was our custom GPT was doing. It does better because it does go more de in depth into the conversation. It plans up the follow-up schedule, what we need to do. And then all you need to do is copy this or it has already created a patient letter for you. So all you need to do is just send this to the patient's email address. That's it. The whole conversation that you have had, you just keep your phone open, free AI or any sort of tool like this. The conversation gets copied, copy-pasted, you put it in your computer. But the whole time your hands are free and you're communicating with the patient, you're talking to the patient, you're connecting with the patient. So that is, that is the advantage of using a tool. And I think this is something which every doctor should start exploring. This is the power of generative AI. And like I said, you can get a summary sender to the patient. You can just take this summary and you can just post it to the patient. You can go to their email address or WhatsApp, whatever. So these are some of the AI scribe tools. For example, DeepScribe, AI scribe, they are paid versions. India also has uh, a couple of them. Uh, there's one called Suno AI and all that. So, but uh, the best thing is gonna be when these AI scribes are gonna come with integrated with your electronic health record. That's where the user experience is really gonna get very, very rich and people are really gonna enjoy and probably that will increase the adoption of electronic health records to a greater extent. So. I hope this was something that was useful to you that, that I wanted to show. Now let's go on to the next interesting part and most people uh, literally ask me that is it right that you're teaching people to use AI for writing papers? I mean, where is the creativity going to go? So first let's try to understand this, that can we at all use artificial intelligence for medical research paper writing? And all of us sitting in this room who are academicians, we are believe that writing a paper is such a hassle that to publish it, it takes three to four months to six months. The drafting itself takes about two months and then there's so much of things to do beyond our clinic work. So can these things be shortened and improved with better outputs using artificial intelligence? So let's see what do the journals say. If you see I'm quoting from all these journals here and they say that artificial intelligence can be used but it cannot be an author and the use of AI tools has to be disclosed but the response of the AI is completely your responsibility as an author. So the journals are very, very clear and specific about this. Again, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors clearly says that tool like a chat GPT should not be listed as an author due to their inability to ensure accuracy and originality, but you can use it with a human responsibility, attribution and taking care of plagiarism. And now we'll have something called AI versus AI plagiarism. So AI content will be ha becoming a plagiarism to another AI content. So that is something that we have to counter probably in the, in the, in the days to come, but as we, as we keep on using AI for drafting it. So what do you do and how do you disclose this? So my next speaker has come so I know when to end. Uh, so during the, so this is, this is kind of a disclaimer that we need to give and uh, if possibly the paper on CGM comes out in a couple of days in Dr. Jyoti Day's journal, we have used this kind of a disclosure where you say that during the preparation of the work, the authors have used this particular tool, the service and the version. So it's like chat GPT 4.0 version this for what purpose? Have you used it for drafting the paper, for data analytics? After using the tool, the author reviewed and edited the content, which is very important. That puts the human in the loop and they take full responsibility for the content of the publication. 
so this disclosure will definitely make things very much ethical uh, now how do you use artificial intelligence for writing a paper this is a three hour workshop that we do but this is a summary slide that you can take back and try to figure out on your own if you don't our workshops are there for you where we take you step by step so for the structure creation your you can use size space elicit and skite for the literature review the literature review is done beautifully with consensus as well for your content generation you can use a lot of perplexity and a lot of chat gpt when you're using when you're using the after generating the content so generating means using generative ai after the review of literature feeding it into the system you're generating the content now you need to create your own words otherwise you'll end up in ai plagiarism so you need a drafting assistant and this is where you can use a tool like a quillbot and this is what i use i use the paid version and it gives you a fantastic draft which can even be made plagiarism free using ai and with your own inputs and of course you can use it for also generating citations tagging the citations in line and also reference integration so you know the one two three superscripts that you have that can also be done using quillbot as well as with chat gpt if you give the right kind of prompt now for data analytics we used to hire a statistician and a data scientist for doing that you can do this very well with chat gpt 40 and you can also use paid tools like tableau for doing it so this summary slide will actually give you an understanding how you can use it it is very very individualized not everybody will be familiar with all of them but you have to figure out in permutation and combination what which one works best for you but trust me if you start using ai for writing a paper you will be publishing much more paper in a much shorter period of time with a much better and superior quality of content which is the purpose of medical science so uh, a good snapshot of this might help you to understand the most needed tools for ai in medical research right so let's move on now so that's this that's the part of the ai in medical research now alok is here and he's going to tell us how to create powerpoint presentation using artificial intelligence but allow me to now give you a little bit of uh, now I'm taking over a little part of Ohm who could not come here and I'm going to tell you how we can use certain tools like Microsoft Designer and Canva for your social media. We all use post for social media, right? We all use it even for social media marketing. We, we create medical contents, we push it for our marketing. So how can we use AI effectively for doing that and also making it attractive and as well as reach the right kind of patient with the right content? Let's explore this two tools I'm going to talk about Microsoft designer and Canva both has the paid and the free version of using you can feel free to use the free version once you're familiar with it and you feel it's really value added start paying for it otherwise there's no point subscribing so this is the QR code for using Microsoft designer you can just Google search it or if you want the easy way of accessing it this is the QR code for getting Microsoft designer and how many of you have used Microsoft designer anybody in the room All right three few people of us now so what can you do with Microsoft designer let's look at this video clipping let's see what we are doing here so you can see all the different types of uh, you know uh, types of uh, templates are there that that you can start using it from in Microsoft designer so once you go into Microsoft designer it opens up the templates section and you're asking it for a template so what am I asking for? So I'm asking it that create an informative image on rising prevalence of obesity and metabolic disorders in India. Use professional style with blue and green color to represent health and wellness. Remember, this is the prompt which I'm giving based on which the response is going to come. Okay. So let me see what it gives me. So it'll take some time. Now it's generating the design for you. Now it's very fast. I think this video was recorded about many months back. So now designer has become more fast. Copilot is also working very good these days. All right, where is this? It'll be coming at the end, yeah. So now you can see it has given uh, a beautiful image. Many such images have, the, have been created. Now I'm trying to create a post on fighting metabolic disease, creating awareness on metabolic disease on my Facebook with this okay so now I've picked up I picked up uh, out of this I'm gonna just possibly take this image because I like this it has a lot of green in it and I'm going to now create the post on Facebook so now I'm gonna go to my chat GPT after this and I'm gonna give it a prompt to help me create a post okay 
So what am I writing to chat GPT here? So here I'm writing that create an informative Facebook post on the rising prevalence of obesity and metabolic disorder in India with relevant statistics, which it will pick it up from the internet. Use professional style and tone. It's a very simple example how you can create a, such an effective post in just one minute. You have the image and yeah, so now you have the content, right? So you have the health risk, the demographic impact, a couple of statistical number to show you that yes you are reading and it's got all the hashtags into it all right so now I just need to go onto my Facebook and I need to post this all I need to do here is go into my Facebook account right I'm going to create the add the post I'm going to add the image which I had generated from my Microsoft designer and I'm going to post it and there you go you have a fantastic post created in possibly less than a minute I think video looks longer but you could do this much much in a shorter span of time next is another very interesting tool which I use and this whole presentation has been made on Canva uh, is how you can use Canva. Canva is a fantastic tool. It's it's a tool that's used by designer. I think the RX guys also use this here, Canva, and many people use this Canva. Been using it for a long time, and it builds beautiful creative images. And if you're really getting into it, so you can create a lot of good images. So this is the QR code. It has an app too. You can use it on app as well. And again, I'm not promoting Canva. <laughs> and I'm not getting endorsed by them either. Maybe we can have them sponsor the next year's DiecareCon. <laughs> I, I saw their ad coming up on TV, so they're really going. So now what I'm doing here is I want to create I want to create a post on for LinkedIn. LinkedIn is a professional network. So I want to create a post with references from recent articles on the impact of AI in healthcare. So that's that's my post. Okay. So let's I'm for going to create the content. So I've used my GPT photo. This is for creating my content sorry so what I'm going to do I've so you can see the content has been created now about early diagnosis operational efficiency so that's a good one so I'm going to take this copy paste it now I'm going to go to Canva Now Canva has an option of connecting your LinkedIn account to this as well so here I'm going to start creating an image from Canva so this is the Canva template I'm going to look for this so I've selected one particular template here and this is a template is how artificial intelligence will impact the future and work right so all I'm going to do is change the wordings on this so all I need to do is just make some changes to the words my topic is how artificial intelligence will impact the future of healthcare and I could add my website to that and then I have the feature of timing my whole post on LinkedIn because my LinkedIn account is linked with my Canva account. So now what I'm going to do is this is an MP4 video which I have created on, on Canva. Now let's see what it does. I'm going to copy paste my uh, chat GPT uh, post which I have already generated. And uh, as you can see the whole post has been copied. The image of the video is already there. The, the MP4 video is already there. I make my certain corrections you need to always check that's where the human in the loop is so you remove the references and this is now what you're seeing below is this is a widget which was there which is still there on my on my laptop this is a paraphraser widget so what happens it picks up the word and if you don't like something you can paraphrase it and change it into something else so this is all generative AI that we're using at the moment just just to simply create a, a, a LinkedIn post that is going to probably reach many people so once I do that, I go for publishing and it prepares the design and now let's go on to my LinkedIn account. If I open this, you can see that my post has been published and it is showing how artificial intelligence will impact the future of healthcare. Some people pay designers, and I don't want to take away anybody's job, but some people pay creative <laughs> professional people for doing this, but this is how you can do it on your own. And it's it's fantastic uh, tool that you can start exploring. No, no, they are events, guys. They will always exist, don't worry. 
So now there's another tool called Grok. It's very fast. It's a Grok. Grok is fantastic. It gives you very good responses in in minutes. So let's see what I'm prompting to Grok AI. So the advantage of Grok is you can choose the model. So I choose I, cho I chose Mistral over there. So here, see, uh, I'm I'm asking Grok that I'm a diabetologist. Create a social media post to promote awareness on diabetes care for my page followers and. It does a good job in creating a uh, post. So you could use ChatGPT, you could use Grok, you could use Perplexity, whatever you like. But these posts are fantastic, and you could customize it more with the prompts that you're giving. So prompting is so very important. And this is the fun part, actually. I mean, we all use social media so much in a day. We could really use it for creating these cre important posts for uh, you know, education. Now, many people ask me that, you know, why should we use Gemini? Gemini is by Google. And people said it's it's bad. It's not even close to Chat GPT, and Google is not going to come anywhere near it. But Gemini has really developed since then. So what I realized is the best part of using Gemini is helping you plan your itinerary. Itinerary, and this is what I so this when I made this video, I was actually attending a conference in Varanasi. So what I've done here, look, look at my prompt. So I told them that I'm visiting the city of Varanasi for the first time. I will be landing at 11 a.m. on Saturday, and this was this is a true prompt which I created. Right. This was actually my schedule. I have a lecture at the event on Saturday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m., which eventually happened at 7 p.m. though, and Sunday morning from 10 to 11 a.m. Besides that, I shall be free. My return flight is on Sunday 9 p.m. Now design a customized sightseeing itinerary for me for Varanasi for the trip. And it knows my travel plan. It knows my travel preference. So based on my conference schedule, it literally gave me when I should be going to the Ghat Darshits. That is cool, right? So could you use this in your international travel? No, it's not. Uh, there's no s everywhere. It's, there's science everywhere at the point of time. But, but these are things that could help us. The purpose here is to improve our productivity. Yes, ChatGPT does this. Yes, ChatGPT also does that. But the advantage of using Gemini, I would say, would be you could actually. Ah, yes, you can do that as well, yeah. That's exactly what I'm saying. So this could be pushed into Google Calendar, and beyond your Google Calendar, this could actually fit in with all your travel dates and everything that could sync. So it could actually have a lot of integration coming in because Google has access to everything that you owe. So <laughs> yeah. So then these are cocktail models. You know, it takes in all the things. So again, for image generation, this is the last one I'm going to show before I close. Is you could use Copilot, but you could also use Dali. These these works very good. Microsoft Copilot, Microsoft Designer, both are good for creating fantastic images. And these are some of the images that you sh you saw that you know I keep using in our presentations. You could use Explore it, and it w it works good if you can contextualize it and use it in the right place. The last part few important generative AI tools. I've already showed you about Grok. I showed you about Quillbot. You could use Claude to read a lot of research papers, summarize content. Gemini, I showed you the advantage of it. Now, uh, Dr. Alok will tell you the advantage of using Gamma and Tomes. I'm not going to talk about that. Perplexity is fantastic. Please use it for the research literature review. It does fantastic in summarizing your content. Use Copilot to generate more and more images. Llama 3 is already there on your WhatsApp, so you can use it. Uh, on the go. This is a Gen AI prism. I give this to everybody. So you have a scan shot of this. These are all the tools that you can use. You can see uh, its its usefulness. You can even use it to create music. I'm going to show you one music that we created using AI right after this. And this is the QR code you want to have. This is the Gen AI platform where it's like your Play Store or App Store and you have access to all these uh, cool tools which you can use for day-to-day -day productivity. Science is there everywhere, but the most important part is to improve the outcome. So the improve the productivity, save your time. So we are looking at more AI and physician collaboration with AI assistants, and the successful collaboration will make sky as the limit. But at every step, we should be using AI ethically with bias mitigation, ethical deployment, use a diverse data set for learning, transparency must be there, and it should be used with in a patient-centric manner. There should be more and more regulatory guidelines. The government of India is working on such, and there are international guidelines. But we need more and more data privacy regulations. And setting the standards and validation is important. That's where clinician comes in. We need to be literate enough to validate the AI tools that we are doing. 
I'll leave you with this question that as we evolve with AI, do you want to be the human in the AI loop or do you want AI in the human loop? So AI will help us transition from evidence-based medicine to data-driven precision medicine. It's time we come out from this wow factor, ask the question, how is it doing and how is it functioning? If you all say we are ready to revolutionize our healthcare with artificial intelligence, then please allow me to introduce uh, Dr. AI to the community. I don't know why the music is not playing. Is there apparently a music here? So at Doctors AI, we have a lot of activities. Alok does the journal club. We have a Med AI web hour. We also have an update hour where we invite people on an open forum discussion on about what AI is going to do into our day-to-day -day activity. We have a series of podcasts. If you would want to watch the podcast, this is the QR code. You could have access to the whole series of podcasts we've been conducting for over a year. And we'll invite all of you to be a part of this community. This is the LinkedIn community link. So on LinkedIn, this is where you find us. We now have over 1,500 global community members across the, across the globe. And uh, this would be more interesting to everyone. This is our WhatsApp group. So please take a snapshot of this. And we'll invite everyone to join us, the WhatsApp group. This has over more than 800 members now. And uh, it's an open to all. So we are all learning. And we intend to learn from each other. So nobody is an expert at Dr. AI. We are all students. And the most important is as a community, we want to learn together with the fraternity. At the end, I would invite all of you to join us for the Doctors AI Virtual Global Summit, which is going to be on 14th and 15th of December with Dr. Bansi Sabu having a keynote session at that event. Please scan this QR code and register for this event. And we'll be happy to see you there. We'll have a global speakers, including the Microsoft AI for Health director, Dr. William Brinson Wicks, has also agreed to take a keynote session at the Doctors AI Global Summit. The abstract submission is also open, so if anybody has been stimulated strongly enough to write a paper on artificial intelligence, then you can scan the QR code, submit an abstract, and we'll invite you to read out your, paper, ap uh, your poster or uh, oral uh, presentation at the summit. Thank you very much. I will end by saying one simple thing, that healthcare practice will be transitioning from evidence-based medicine to data-driven medicine. But at this point, it's important that we doctors and medical professionals will have to be in the forefront in the driving seat, driving this change. Thank you.